Wow. Well, this is an exciting one. Uh, is Uri Schneider, your host here, Transcending Stuttering. It's a big honor to have this opportunity for a conversation with Joseph Cornett. Um, I think you're going to enjoy this one. And uh, it's hard to give a proper introduction, but I had a chance to meet uh, Joseph earlier this year. Uh, in preparation for what he's going through right now, which are interviews for his residency. He's uh, finished his third year at Columbia, finished his fourth year at Columbia Med School. And um, he studied at Yale. He's at Columbia. In addition to that, he's had some incredible opportunities and experiences in Australia, in India, in Kenya, some very formative experiences. Um, he's incredibly insightful, incredibly well-spoken. He also has great interest in mental wellness and hobbies that take him into music, choir, drama, photography, and he also knows a thing or two about stuttering. So it's a great honor to introduce and to have with us Joseph Cornett. Welcome. Hi. Hey, thank you, Yuri. Yeah. So as I always like to open up, what would be one thing you'd like people to know about you or you're excited to share that might not be in the formal bio or on your resume? <laughs> you did a great job. Uh, so you aren't you know, m m uh, giving me much room here. Um, I, I, yeah, I would say a, a general trend. Uh, that I have loved to have as I uh, look back as having a, a yes and um, approach to my hobbies and to my work and to where I go and where I live and the route that I am having in uh, medicine is one more way that I am trying to do that um, and so mu music being trained uh, classically and then in jazz and then uh, good gospel um, and now um, having some uh, new roles here in med school has been fun and trying to always grow what I have experience with um, and what I have learned of um, and what I can do. What is that yes and? Can you just expand on that? Because I think it's so profound and you shared with me the impression it's made on some interviews and places you've been. What does it yes and mean to you? And like, how does that have meaning? I am glad that you uh, find it uh, profound because I think the phrase came from you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is part of how I'm wired and part of why I chose this field is it um, allows me to do a lot of the things that in my life I want to be able to do. Um, I joke that the one thing I don't want to do is one thing and that a struggle that I have had um, in my mind for years now is that I want to do multiple uh, lifetimes of work in one lifetime. And finding a balance between my interests and between breadth and depth um, is a challenge that I really uh, um, enjoy. And I think you may hear me say again on the interview that I think that all meaningful work has a lot of uh, challenges. And so you should find the work, and that also includes hobbies, but the, you know, the things that you do that have uh, challenges that um, engage you and make you feel uh, fulfilled because you can't avoid uh, challenges. And so the challenge of trying to balance my interest in how I want to use my time uh, is one that I quite enjoy. Love it. So we met a little less than six months ago. Uh, just I think about, in June? I think it was the beginning of June. Yeah. So that would put us just about six months ago. And uh, it's been incredible to be on the ride with you. It feels like <laughs> going through going through med school vicariously um <laughs> but it's also been awesome to just get to know you but 
um, I came into the story late in your journey, in your story, <laughs> you know, a couple chapters in and the best chapters are yet to be written. But can you share can you share something about um, where you come from, the stock you come from and, and some of the experiences you've been through? Because looking at you now, you know, the spotlight's on, you're all trimmed and and sitting there all poised and crushing it we're catching you in the middle zoom interviews yes in the middle of these zoom interviews for residencies from one of the great you know medical schools in the country and you went to yale but mm -hmm. um it hasn't been easy street for you so i was no. wondering if you could just share like some of what you've been through uh sure. some of the tougher chapters with the stuttering thing just to understand and appreciate you know where you yes. come from First, uh, the idea that you know this is late in my story. Um, it's nice to be at you know this point in my life where you could say that, and also say that, that I am quite um, early in my own journey. And one thing that I am, am excited about for the kind of life work that I am aiming to my you know, myself at is you don't peak until you're near the end, and I quite like that. So. I was raised in North Carolina um, by a, a surgeon and a, a radiologist. And I joke that I must have inherited, while I did inherit the love for uh, medicine, I inherited what you must be a recessive gene. So one that they had, but you know, did not show uh, for a breadth and depth uh, generalist. Rather than, rather than having a, a niche that you get really, really, uh, become an expert at. And I, uh, I've had many um, advantages in, in life, um, as well as many uh, challenges, and the advantages have made the uh, challenges um, much easier to handle when I have this whole uh, yeah, network around me. Um, a, so when I was a younger kid, uh, I began to have my stammer at uh, six or um, uh, seven uh, years old. I was already you know, in speech uh, therapy for some sounds. I wasn't you know, saying my R's. And in fact, I'm even as late as um, middle school, I was asked uh, by one a classmate if I was from England because of how I said uh, ka rather than car. And when I began to have this stammer, um, I can continued with the same uh, the therapist, and it was pretty in intense. Uh, my stammer, uh, and it has improved slowly as I have have yum. I got an older, yeah, much like the stock market, it will have its ups and downs as it uh, grows. And as a younger kid, I also had a pretty intense case of um, ADHD, pretty intense on the AD part and on the H part, and had some you know, difficulties with being able to follow the uh, social cues, the um, impulsive behavior. And so that was part of why um, although definitely not the only uh, re reason uh, why I was bullied, you 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 could say, but maybe um, um, ostracized, uh, being perhaps more ac accurate in uh, the third and fourth and fifth grade, and that left an an um, imprint for uh, many years, and I have tried. Uh, at, you know, at this point to hold on to how that felt so that when I am engaging you know, with you know, other kids and adults who, who, who feel uh, uh, like that, I um, am more I'm able to meet them where they are. Um, I then uh, went through uh, your middle school and high school and music became more of a, a large, large role in um, who I was and how I um, engaged with my uh, peers. And it was quite a privilege to get used to being on stage and being in a place where people you know, wanted to um, have me on stage. And a, a compliment that has stuck with me 
from near the end of high school was the uh, father of a, a classmate who said, when a, a lot of, of these kids uh, go up there, I really want them to do well and I get really uh, nervous Yama, for them. It, I can see that uh, they are too. When you go on stage, I can um, uh, sit back and, and watch because I know that it will be great and because you uh, look so uh, good, comfortable up there. And that was when I began to learn that, like, yes, I, I knew that I was good at what I did um, musically, but I was still incredibly nervous. Uh, if you were right right next to me, you, you could watch my hands as they uh, uh, trembled. But I was, was beginning to learn to show a confidence that was um, authentic. Um, but uh, show that until I believed it uh, my, uh, uh, myself. And the act of, um, of acting that, that way was a, a feedback loop that I can continue to um, investigate as I got older. Um, another large uh, childhood um, life experience that really impacted me was the ability to uh, travel with my uh, parents, my, uh, my uh, your mother being a, a surgeon to, uh, to Kenya and get to be a part of the uh, uh, cleft lip and cleft the palate rib repair teams. And seeing at that young age, the age of uh, 13 was my uh, uh, first time. Yeah, I mean, I have been, been able to go back uh, six times um, and I'm going to offer a, a few weeks each, going from a very pri privileged place in the U.S. and a, a privileged place uh, within that, to a to a place uh, with a lot of uh, naked injustice and inequity. Was the thing that I really wrestled with as a sensitive kid, and it formed what. I hope is not a, a quarter life crisis, but rather an eighth life crisis of how do I, I, I make sense of, of a world where this ha happens? I can no longer um, ignore it. It's you know, not just an ads on TV, TV, TV. I have interviewed these people. I have worked um, with them. I have uh, held the, uh, the parents as they cry and as they hope uh, for their young kids um, in various, yeah, my mother wings at the um, hospital there. And I came to this worldview and this sense of purpose and aim that I still have, 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 have now of, if all this is out there, the best way for me to live my life is to aim you know, myself uh, 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 right at it. I've lost my blinders. And I'm not the you know, kind of person who wants to have them uh, back on now. And so rather than having it you know, out of the corner of my eye, I might as well be looking right at it. And so I knew that I, I, I wanted to work in um, a global health of, of, of some sort. And now I would also really enjoy working with the you know, underserved uh, populations here, whether that's uh, ref refugees or those who have grown up here and are being very much yeah, underserved uh, by their uh, nation. And it was that that brought me into medicine, actually, rather than the other way, way around. And so this growth of my, in my interest in global health and medicine and my roles in, in music, and then this slow realization as I get older of one, people are not yeah, thinking about you yeah, nearly as much as you think they are. They are thinking yeah, mostly about uh, them, uh, themselves. That's a, a thing that I think every uh, person learns at yeah, some point. And when you internalize that, a life becomes a whole lot um, 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 easier to uh, yeah, 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 navigate. And beginning to internalize what I have to offer and how I can use the harder uh, chapters in my life 
I'm, in, uh, I'm including uh, a um, 18 month episode of adolescent uh, depression that really had no uh, trigger. I was the happiest I had been in my life uh, 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 up to that point, right before it happened at age uh, 14 or so. And I had a, a family who uh, viewed you know, what I was going through as real and important. And I was able to get access to uh, resources. And I had a school that was you know, I'm willing to work uh, you know, with me as I had been doing quite you know, well in school and they were able to be uh, flexible with when I turned uh, things in and was able to come out of it with and using a wide range of the you know, resources you know, that I had, including uh, therapy and medication and um, exercise, like uh, you know, working out. And that all really helped to quite near the end of it, already realize that it had given me a deeper and richer understanding of the emotional uh, landscape of being a person and a kind of intuition for what it's like to go through you know, various other kinds of, of mental health um, uh, challenges that all involve a certain degree of um, um, irrationality that you might be aware of, but still you can't help in the moment. And that has really helped me you know, in, uh, um, interact with friends and family and uh, strangers and your patience now and being able to speak to the a vulnerability of being a human being and being able to still be a, a competent you know, in that space. And as someone who stutters, the inherent uh, sense of, uh, of, 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 of vulnerability there and the uh, your confidence that you can have, you mean those don't have to be you know, mixed Conclusive, those are not two ends of one axis. They are two different um, axes. And if you can maximize your expression of uh, your vulnerability and also uh, you maximize your poise and composure and grace as a, a doctor, I found that that has really helped me meet my Give patients now and in the uh, uh, future where they are and help them feel empowered in a really uh, vulnerable time in their lives. As you know, I can listen all day. Um, <laughs> I wanted I wanted to just um, alley oop if I could. There was a wonderful story you told me about an experience in India. Would you like to just share that? Uh... Oh yes. The, and then we can go into um, this this the, paradox the that yeah and then, and then going into this paradox you just talked about how these are two separate axes the vulnerability yes. and the poise um, but i know there was that experience in india that was quite yes impressionable the, so i was able to spend a, a summer in a new delhi in india i'm after my uh, junior year of college through the uh, global health scholars uh, program at Yale, and I was the only the only uh, foreigner in my uh, group, and I was driving with a, a coworker one one day, and he re remarked to me, "You um, sound like Obama." And a, a few things went you know, through my head. One, yes, I do have an American accent, and so that makes makes me sound more like him than anyone else here. But two, it, it was, and she um, explained the way that I think a lot about what I say. And I had realized at that point that I had dovetailed my love for being precise with my word choice with, I have these pauses you know, in my speech that I don't have uh, control over, but over the years I, had worked on some subconscious mechanics to 
make them you know must sound like they were on purpose <laughs> and to also use them to have you know more time to you know, think about you know what i said rarely does my mind get ahead i'm sorry rarely does my mouth you know, get ahead of my mind that that was a, a touch of um, 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 irony there uh and that comment stuck with me because it showed that i could use this what yeah, yeah, I felt like a, a, a liability and to be frank is still of having these pauses in my speech that I couldn't completely uh, control to make it an asset and make it a way that people really try to listen to what I have to say uh, because I give them space to the process and because I clearly give a lot of thought to what I say, and so maybe they should too. So it was a quite a a a, a lovely thing that did did get to have heard at at that age. Indeed, and and at the same time, nothing is black and white. Nothing is absolute. Mm -hmm. So here you are, six months ago or so, and and you're <laughs> yes. doing pretty well. And, and at the time you said to me, like, actually, things are pretty good. I'm really reaching out because I'm looking down the road a couple months mm -hmm. ahead and be having these interviews, residency, and mm -hmm. it's going to be this. It's, it's pandemic times. It's going to be an interview like this with a talking head. And, and that might be of all the things that I do, I might be judged for, you know, one aspect or one mm -hmm. facet mm -hmm. and and you were concerned about the liability that might be mm -hmm. might be there as confident as you were with everything else what were you thinking then because you seem to have your head on your shoulders you seem to have this really rich human wholesome you know really good outlook on humans and on your intrapersonal landscape mm -hmm. and you've had this wonderful compliment that you're the cadence of your speech, while one might say is a is a stuttering disorder, someone else says it sounds like Obama. Um, the way that you're surfing it, and uh, and at the same time, there's a certain concern that that the world yes. is going to judge you unfairly. They're going to size you up as less than you really are. Can you just share like what that thinking was like? And because with everything you said one would think, hey, it's a, it's a walk in the park. I mean, if you just listen <laughs> to what you said, put it into play, everything's simple, right? Because the, the world isn't thinking about you as much as you're thinking about what they're thinking about what you're thinking about. And once you recognize that, things get easier. Um, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yes, I, I am glad and you yet. Uh, pushed back. Yes. Yeah, so and yet, yeah. So it was years in the making and... I have noticed that when I think about my future and I think years, uh, years ahead or in broad strokes, I um, actively and passively uh, prevent my speech from uh, factoring in to what I do. Now I, now, I would not say I'm gonna go be an auctioneer, <laughs> but in terms of the, the heights of what I think I can accomplish, but you, uh, 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 when it comes to the next step, the uh, next phase, I, I am quite um, aware um, of it. And I'm up until being in med school and being in the um, hospital in med school, my Stadamer had been largely a, a social uh, hurdle to make a, a first impression, to introduce yourself at a, a party, to uh, give a, a big, uh, to, to talk, to jump into the uh, middle of an um, active group, uh, a conversation that is um, humming along and you have this more halting uh, cadence. I had slowly worked through that yeah, over the uh, years and now I was in the um, hospital where it was now not just a, a social and a personal thing, but also professional. And 
a lot of how a, a medical student is assessed is on their oral presentations on busy rounds in a busy hospital. And there are lots of words that you can't uh, dance around. They're long words. You have to, you, you must say them in this order. And so my flexibility, my adaptability and you know, my conversation, I, I felt I was able to use that as well. And so that took months to work through and I had to give them a compensate by getting really good at the structure of the oral uh, uh, presentation. I just had to you know, put in more, more you know, effort. You know, I mean, I grew to the point where it was no longer a strong Im impediment. They do still take maybe 20% uh, uh, longer than you know, someone else's would, but was able to learn how to have you know, some kind of poise during those as well. Uh, during a pretty intense uh, cognitive load. But now you know, I was on Zoom. And so all of my skills that I had learned and the ways that I had come to view it in a ho holistic way when I am in a person and I can use nonverbal and how I hold you know, myself in my uh, body language, I felt like that was going to be a, a good concern and also Zoom gets you more in your own head. You can see uh, yourself um, on the screen. You, you can hide you know, yourself and, and I always do. In fact, I just will now. And you have less time, but you also, um, Zoom is a heightened state. And I had done well on interviews in the past, um, but Zoom was, a new me, me, medium that I had not done a, a, a lot of because most of med school or being in the um, hospital, it was still in the person rather, rather, rather than over Zoom for where I was in my uh, training. And I was really nervous. How would I do? Would it influence my ability to showcase who I am and how I think and how I say and what I say? Uh, and would these skills that I had learned still be useful? And so I begin this uh, month long journey with you. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Cause I remember one of the, one of the goals that you had that you articulated that I thought was so profound and so telling was if you're walking out of the lobby of your building and the person who's servicing the door says, you know, good morning. <laughs> yes. You just want to be able to say, hey, good morning. Thanks. You too. And just be able to just do that without a thought or a care in the world. And yes. not worrying about the timing of it. Yes. Yes. Another one is <laughs> also another one was getting interviewed by the television station. Like if there was some fluke yes. weather event or some yes. Some event yes, happened yes, nearby yes. and, and they, you get stopped and on, the a, on the street as a on the street. And 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 I would and I was hypothesizing what I would do. And I would probably say to them, or what I had always imagined, and I would need to go through the effort of you know, changing uh, you know, what I would say would be, uh, you, know, you don't want me on your pro program. Uh, I you know, will not make good TV for you. Uh, you're gonna want to interview you know, somebody else who can uh, you know, be, be more engaging. And that would be, I think, a way of, deflecting from my own anxiety uh, about it. And to be honest, being on this uh, the podcast, I, I have not put a lot of my recorded voice out there and no one likes their voice uh, when it's recorded at, at, at first. But I think that if you have a speech impediment, the, the, the instinct is to have an extra uh, visceral a response and you, you know, if I want to be an advocate, I need to have more and more of my voice uh, out there to um, advocate. And so this is actually a great first step, one could say, in putting out my recorded voice with you know, someone who knows you know, quite well how my voice works. Absolutely. But it is a thing that has you know, held me back from doing what I want to do. And we we are we we are all to, yeah, an extent, our own worst um, enemy. Uh, 
we all could uh, you punch our way through a, a drywall you know, if we could, but our bodies for good reason prevent us from even trying to, to do that. You have to really overcome a lot of um, your um, inborn instincts if you want to do that. And sometimes those instincts aren't helpful. Uh, yes, I won't break my fist, but also I won't be on a whole lot of podcasts and you know, YouTube channels and being able to put my voice out there. And I need to work um, actively against that. And as I get older, that is a thing I want to do more and more on the internet most, because that's you know, where things are happening. Most people won't appreciate this and we're not gonna go into the depth of the story. But mm. I definitely think Dr. Fred Bomback would get a kick out of seeing Uri Schneider hosting Dr. Joseph <laughs> Burnett. And that this will definitely be the first of many times that Joseph Cornett's voice will be heard. <laughs> but it's not by accident that I mentioned that goal and tied into this, yeah. this, this opportunity, this chance that you're taking to do this, which mm -hmm. is not to be taken for granted. And it didn't, you, you said yes a long time ago, but it took a long time to actually take the leap. And so I'm very grateful. Uh, what you. could you share? Um, less about anything else, more about your experience in the six months of work that we did together. We had, it was yes. interesting because it was during COVID, it was mostly Zoom. Then there was this window of time where we were able to meet in person. Mm -hmm. But the idea of, uh, of longer meetings kind of stacked together and then the cadence yeah. of spreading things out as needed, but on the front end kind of packing in some, mm -hmm. what was the, I'm interested in just in your experience, the reflection on the cadence of it, the substance of it. What was what was valuable to you in that um, process that helped you start doing more things that you wanted to be doing? So one thing that I think you do quite well in your um, approach, and I became an I'm already um, um, having um, um, had some experience uh, with this is the uh, a CBT or the uh, a cognitive behavioral uh, uh, therapy um, 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 approach. How do you can conceptualize uh, your thoughts and your uh, feelings and your actions, and how do you have those be um, in line? And I actually spent years on that in in, in high school. Well, well after um, I was no longer uh, clinically uh, depressed because. It was right up my my alley that you know, kind of work. I mean, you get to cerebralize. I don't think that's a word. Uh, how we you can, how you we feel? Can, we can contact the people at Webster. Began <laughs> that right. How do you think about how you feel? Combines two of my uh, uh, favorite things, and you incorporate that well. And that was one thing that you know, even still, I had to make room for in uh, the you know, work that we did because I, I wanted to work on make mechanics and how do I do these concrete tools to make my speech more fluent. And what you did um, almost in assiduously, uh, but also um, above board was incorporate how I felt about my Stutter and Stutamer in the in the moment before and after and identifying what were the places where I could have the most growth. Um, for all of my talk about learning to have EBM competence and poise uh, amidst it, when you're in the uh, the uh, you're middle of having a block, a, a, a lot of those you know, mechanisms go flying out the window, and learning how to hold them in as they are struggling to uh, uh, fly away was a thing to work on the you know, liberately and also how to reframe, how to speak about my stutter to myself and to others. And I had already made a, a lot of ground in the years prior, but had a, a lot of room left to grow and still do. And I use quite a lot of what I learned from you and how to frame it um, in my interviews actually. And that has been quite a, a wonderful to be able to lean on. Being able to have an intensity of uh, th therapy too is Im 
the port end. Uh, uh, the therapy of any sort, whether it's uh, physical or speech or uh, psychiatric or uh, psychologic requires a lot of work. And it requires you know, someone who is willing to you know, practice things day by day. And with each new time that you meet, you process more things, you delve deeper, and you learn more things that you can work on. And um, to be able to re, you know, visit them with a certain high enough dose gives you enough time to delve into what you really need to work on next. And then having enough time in between to work on them um, is a balance that I think is, is, is a thing to work on and change over time. And I think you've done a great job with that. Well, I owe you the big thanks because it was in, in the work that we did that helped me further refine this hmm. framework, the Transcending Center framework, um, the four parts. Uh, I was curious yeah. if something stands out to you if that was particularly either a watershed moment or uh, something yes. that you keep turning back to. I know we, we had a shared Google Doc we would keep, mm -hmm. and then we've sharpened it, and you've created your own um, kind of journal of sorts. So is there something yes. that, that you turn back to, and looking back really stands out as significant or valuable to you? The reframing to me that was most important and um, helpful was not you know, focusing on minimizing the uh, disfluency, but on maximizing the uh, cleanness of it. Um, not trying to prevent the blocks or the uh, yeah, 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 repetitions, but if you're focusing on what are the things that you have learned to do to cope you know, with them over years, and in my case, the 20 years now, that are not an inherent part of it, but are a, a distraction and learning new ways to, uh, new uh, yeah, mechanisms in the uh, yeah, uh, yeah moment to make them clean and to maximize the engagement that you can have you know, with the uh, listener. So rather, rather, rather than scrunching and turning in and trying to, to push it out, you know, uh, I, uh, letting the uh, the pressure drop, you ease back in to it, and that reframing of what my goal is is a much more um, a much a much, a much achievable goal. And I have already begun to use that framework when I interact with the parents of sick kids. Yeah, um, our goal is not, or your goal as a the parent cannot be to, to take away all of their uh, symptoms if they have this chronic thing. And that's, and, and that's our job and we won't always be able to. But what you are uniquely you know, you know, able to do as a, a parent and for you know, my speech, me just being uh, myself is to maximize the quality of life that they have um, around it to maximize the res resiliency that they have so that they feel good about who they are and that it's a clean thing in terms of um, they learn how to grow into being a person that does what they want to do when they want to do it, how they want to, to do it. Um, and that is inclusive of the extra struggles uh, that that they have, but but, but the Soviet yeah, molest them be who they want to be. I think it's incredibly profound and fortuitous that immediately after we finish recording this episode, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Chris Constantino, and he's the one who originated that concept that I shared with you that liked that you're quite fond of. Yeah, you spontaneity. Mm -hmm. The goal. Yes is much more about spontaneity and mm -hmm. either recovering or re-shifting towards that. In the event that you have a stutter at the age of 20, the attempt to eradicate it could become its own <laughs> struggle and its own tension. And 
kind of, as you just said, in, in, in a broader stroke, you know, if someone's dealing with a chronic condition that has some chronicity to it, uh, the eradication of it could may be, not be possible. May not be possible, so it may be an effort in futility. Uh, and it also can render a loss of opportunity yes. in all of the good and all of the, the great things that can happen, notwithstanding the presence of it, or even because of the presence of it. Um, but recognizing the nature of what it is we're living with is so mm -hmm. important and shifting into what we really want. And, and mm -hmm. shifting into thinking what's really possible. And the irony is that often people think, well, if I talk like this, I could never be a doctor. If I talk like this, I could never go overseas and have these, if I talk like this, I could never nail an interview. If I talk mm -hmm. like this, I could never run the med school uh, performance, right? <laughs> and um, and here you're living proof of all those things are, are possible and more if you let yourself give it a shot, if you take mm -hmm. a chance. Um, on the other hand, you could just sit in the corner and say, well, I'm not going to do any of those things till I eliminate the interruptions in my right. speech. Right. And try not to speak like Obama. Um, <laughs> so what, as we come to uh, the last little juncture here, what would you say are some things you're doing today? I listed a few in, in broad strokes, but what are some of the small things, whether it's saying hello to the person at the door? or whether it's doing this podcast, what are some things you're, yes. you're doing today? I'm thinking about the interviews, Joseph, on a right. personal note. It's so amazing. We're catching you in the midst of the height of your interviews and you're not shaking in your boots nonstop to the point that you're you know, <laughs> dysfunctional. And as you said to me before we started recording, you know, as you do them, they do start to get easier. Like mm -hmm. the 14th interview doesn't have the same jitters as the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, but what are some things you're doing today that have kind of become possible for you that maybe weren't as easy or even entertained as possible uh, just a matter of months or years ago? Yes. I would begin by saying to um, anyone who is struggling with this as well, um, that it's one you know, more step at a time. And it can be a big step, it can be a small step, but I, I did not go from uh, not wanting to read a, a, a paragraph in class and, and asking to be skipped to like directing a large a musical performance um, and being in a med, med school. It, you know, it was slow and gradual. And it was also putting myself in places where I had to rise to meet the occasion. I, I, I think that's one approach that has been um, helpful is uh, to take the uh, plunge and then learn how to cope and manage it. And being open about whatever you know, difficulties you're having has been a real uh, saver as I, you know, I'm engaged in these new uh, challenges. So. Uh, saying to my um, uh, mentors as I was in the uh, hospital for the uh, first time, here's what I'm uh, strugg struggling with, here's what I'm working on, and I want you to be aware of this and to let me you know what I can do better, um, what is uh, distracting and what's not. And so what I'm working on right now, one is I, I am very uh, consumed by the interview uh, process. But one thing that I'm still, I'm actively working on, and it you know, almost sounds kind of silly, but in a group, a conversation, when there is a flow and it is humming along and I have a thing that I want to interject, but I have this feeling like I will have an intense stammer and that that would break the uh, flow, my instinct is to just uh, yeah, let it pass. Now, if there's a pause, I would jump, jump in be more if I don't have that uh, feeling I would and I still be must sometimes do but there are a lot of times where I don't and continuing to push myself to do more of that um, is one just day-to-day -day, everyday thing that you know, amidst all these big yama yeah, sounding things that I'm doing these smaller things I'm still having to work on 
And what about, what was the most surprising thing? When you look back, I know that when we were preparing for this next chapter of these interviews mm -hmm. and your program had to write their recommendation and you're looking over all your reviews mm -hmm. and you had all kinds of placements and yes. all different areas of medicine. What was something that was kind of surprising, even looking back, you knew that you'd performed well, you knew you had great reviews, but as we looked more carefully, and hopefully you'll release these in your presidential library or whatever. Um, <laughs> but these reviews were striking in the manner of where stuttering kind of showed up or didn't show up in those reviews. Yes. Would you like to share on that? Because I think that's quite sure. surprising and profound for, for people. Sure. So in the vast majority of my interviews, it was not mentioned at all. Not one bit. And... It, it, you're and that's not to it. say you didn't stutter in the. It's not right. to say you didn't stutter in those situations. <laughs> right, you stutter quite not. nicely. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I always like the way that you uh, phrase that. Um, and then there were a few. Uh, good, good comments made in my evaluations, of. Um, and one was actually said quite uh, yeah, nicely. Um, he has this uh, challenge that in many Yama settings where that would uh, traditionally be a, be a um, hurdle um, in this field, and he has learned to manage it with uh, clear grace and, and poise. And so that does come up, but those were usually with people who I had worked with for a, a shorter you know, amount of time. And so it may have been a way that they were you know, saying that to me through my evals, those whom I had worked with for long for longer, they had already you know, voiced it to me. And so it was just a non-issue by that point. And with all of the things that I've worked through in my own head about my self-image and how I view this as a part of my you know, self-image was still striking to me how little it was, was mentioned. And when I went back to try and find some places you know, for you in my evals where they had been uh, mentioned, I had imagined that they had been said a whole lot more after I had already read them. And that was because I was imbuing it um, in the evals. It was on my mind as, as I was you know, um, reading them. And so I think I had imagined that they had mentioned it too, but they hadn't. So amazing for such a person of great intelligence and thoughtfulness, we are all, we all have <laughs> these blind spots and we're all very susceptible. Okay to seeing things through the lens that seems to be the protective mechanism that's working for us till then. So there was mm -hmm. this feeling that you needed to be on the lookout and you had perceived that there were all these comments and then you read them and it was actually like extremely thoughtful and very poised in communication with patients and colleagues. It was like mind boggling. <laughs> they um, have to focus on, on the outcome and that's right. uh, not the uh, means of getting there. Which that's right. Was which is what you know, you've been saying this whole time, and it's been nice for me to. Um, that's what I have in a I'm in approach in my life in general. But you're right, you know, it was a, a blind spot that I, I had think had for twenty some years. And I think it's incredibly humanizing as well. As I said to you, <laughs> the first time we met, I said, "Look, you you shared with me your resume just to kind of get your background." And even as I, as I introduce you, I'm sure a lot of people are, are, are quite impressed. And I said, you know, in some ways, having a stutter <laughs> kind of humanizes you because otherwise you'd be a bit, <laughs> a bit supernatural. Um, and, and it makes you it makes you endearing. It makes you charming. It makes you approachable. It gives you yeah. charisma and the way you carry yourself with it. it, it it's another facet. It's, it's intriguing. Thank it's you. interesting. And um, one of the things that you shared that I wrote down over the course of the conversations we've been having, you said, um, I think my patients recognize I really want to be here more than the mm -hmm. average doctor, because it would be a lot easier for me to do something that didn't require this face time and talk time. And so it it's on it's on display. Mm -hmm. that I really must want to be here because I've had to choose again and again to yes, be here and not to choose. Time. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, parents who uh, made that comment twice, even you, you're within one week from two you know, different parents that I clearly really want 
to be here and that they felt that they could learn from that. And that kind of generous and humble uh, yeah, compliment has really stuck uh, you with me. Um, so I wanted to just couple I, that. I wanted to couple that with the fact that you shared the, the anticipation that you have before going into a new placement or a new rotation or a new mm -hmm. interview. Like, oh, um, you know, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? How am I going to perform? Because the, the, the demands here are greater than what I've had before. The stakes are higher. So there's a part of that that's just like part of going into a new stage, a new chapter, a new interview. Mm -hmm. It's normal. And as much success as you've had, it doesn't erase the fact that a certain <laughs> dose of that is is normal, is human. Mm -hmm. And and at the same time, it does help to look back at your track record, any of us, and see that we've endured, we've persevered, we've even thrived through situations that did shake us in our boots, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what would be one takeaway as we just kind of wrap up? One thought that you would wish for the world or wish for people who are living with this or have young people that they're raising or people that they care for who stutter, um, you know, that nine-year-old kid, that 12-year-old, 15-year-old Joseph, what would you wish you could share with him or share with the people in his world? I would share uh, just uh, one thing. Um, I would share, I would echo what I, had yeah, Mar yeah, Mar yeah, Mar recently said that the goal is not to not to dammer. The goal is not to make you someone who has no uh, liabilities or uh, uh, challenges. One that's impossible, um, uh, de depending on what the uh, challenge is. And two, that can be what makes us uh, yeah, richer. And especially especially if you um, are fortunate to have people around you and resources or a uh, temperament to um, be able to um, 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 cope uh, with these things. The, the, end, the end goal is for you to be who you want to be, when you want to be, how you want to be, and to, you can find ways often to not just min, 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 minimize the liability of a thing, but to maximize the asset of it. And for many um, um, liabilities, that may just be making it a thing that others can relate to and that you can be open about you know, to be the you know, a change you want to see in the world, to empower others to do the same and to be able to live in their own skin that kind of uh, sub, sub, sublimation of taking the various um, challenges I've had in my life and make, making them into ways that I can help people wrestle with theirs and be okay with having to wrestle uh, uh, yo, uh, yo, uh, with theirs. I have been so moved by people whom I have looked up to who have been open about their uh, frailty and their uh, failures and their uh, challenges. And that has helped me think, wait, I, I can do these things too. My, my moment hasn't passed. Um, you know, I did not write my first you know, m m m uh, symphony at the age of uh, seven like uh, Mozart, but uh, Samuel L. Jackson became a, a major actor uh, you know, you know, in what you know, may be the back half of his life. And people like that have always been more inspiring to me. And I hope that in finding ways to be that for, for others as I progress in my own life, I can find ways to, and have uh, I found you know, some ways to value myself for the uh, challenges and the uh, shortcomings and the, um, the uh, y y y liabilities that uh, make me who I am as a person. Stunning. Well, I'm sure that at this point, it's evident to all uh, why I'm so fortunate and pleased that you took the time to have this conversation. You, you had uh, your wisdom, your words are absolutely precious, worth sharing. And I'm yeah. honored that this will be your first podcast appearance of many. 
hopefully for another episode here, but certainly looking forward to all the wonderful things that are going to come forth and the exciting time to see which doors are opened for you and which doors you choose to walk through in this next chapter of your medical training and the impact you're going to make uh, and where you choose to do it. You know, wherever it is, we'll be very fortunate to have you and we're fortunate to know you and share this time. So thank you. Uh, that's really a, a kind of, of you, sir, and will be in no a s s small part uh, due to your help. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this. And without further ado, we'll let you go on to preparing for the rest of your day. All right. Have a good uh, uh, day, y'all. Thanks, y'all.